Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to Chronix with Raymond Nyson, who's going to talk today about how to improve the power and performance characteristics of machine learning. Raymond, what's changing in machine learning chips? I mean, we, we've, we've got processors that are developed for this. They've been out on the market for a while. What has to change now? So what we're seeing in machine learning is that we started out with massive brute force computation, multiply, add, accumulate. What's changing is now that these algorithms are becoming more and more refined, where you need to use uh, much less brute force methodologies. You want to, you have to be much more power efficient and increase your compute density in order to be able to uh, make the whole problem economically tractable. Is the problem that there's so much data that has to be processed or is it something else? It's really two things. It's the amount of data that needs to flow in and out of the chips that is humongous. And at the same time, we have a lot of processing power inside of the chips. Those two need to be matched. There's a term for it, it's called roofline. And at the end of the day, it just means that you want to be able to feed the beast. You need to have enough memory bandwidth to keep your multiply accumulate units busy on silicon. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So what are we looking at here? As you probably know, most of the workloads in machine learning are really doing matrix vector multiplication under the hood. As you remember from high school, probably matrix vector multiplication is written in shorthand form as 8x times b, where a is the matrix, x is the vector, and the result is b. And every element of the vector b is calculated just as a sum of products, where the matrix is being uh, uh, traversed and the vector is also being traversed in, uh, in, the, in this way. How has that been computed in the past and how does it have to be computed in the future? In the past, in the beginning of machine learning, it, this was just c computed in a general purpose fashion where you had CPUs or you would throw GPUs or FPJs at it and they were initially not necessarily optimized for machine learning. You just used the general purpose uh, arithmetic units to calculate these results. And really what you're doing is heading from calcula individual calculations into simultaneous calculations where you're doing a pattern, right, as opposed to the individual bits? That's correct. So the, what we have to do to take this to a next level is we have to exploit the characteristics of this particular domain. In this particular domain, not only are the workloads characterized by matrix vector multiplication, there's also something special going on with the data. Uh, the data is within a certain dynamic range and that is not all that wide if you compare it to other application domains. And at the same time, the precision of the values is limited. Only You have only a few significant bits and, for example, it makes no sense in the context of machine learning to distinguish between the value of 500,000 and 500,001. Each one of those is a variable for what you're doing, right? They can be modified back and forth. Correct. They can be modified and they uh, can be expressed in a number of different ways and each way has a different efficiency to it. So if you were to simple-mindedly express these values in terms of integers, that would work. That's a brute force way to do it. That's how it all started. And Or you could even use general purpose floating point arithmetic for this, let's say it's third bit floating point. And you would just execute this algorithm and then you would uh, get the result. It was not very efficient, but it did the job in the first three generations. Now what we're doing here is we're actually taking advantage of these dynamic ranges. There's a, a lot, there's been a lot of research in the AI ML space into using smaller and smaller representations of these numbers that are still sufficiently accurate in the end. So the dynamic range is typically between one and a million, give or take, and the precision is just a few bits of, of precision. That lends itself very well for very narrow uh, representations, 8-bit integers, or even very narrow floating point uh, types, such as 10-bit floating point, 9-bit, 11-bit floating point uh, values, where you have uh, one sign bit, you're going to have three or four uh, fraction bits, and you're going to have, for example, five or six exponent bits. And each one of these will be um, modified depending upon what you're trying to do, this specific data that you're working with, and also your needs in terms of how fast you need it to move through, how accurate you need it to, do, to be, right? 
That's correct. So if you compare that uh, with the naive example that I gave just a moment ago, where the naive approach was 20-bit representation, if you express the same thing in just 8 bits or 9 bits or 10 bits, that gives you a tremendous reduction in the required memory bandwidth. That is very good, obviously, for storage. It also allows you to push way more uh, values into the chip than would otherwise have been possible. And therefore, you keep your multipliers busy. At the same time, if you use these very narrow uh, floating point formats, you're going to be able to take advantage from the fact that the uh, amount of area and power that you spend to calculate these results is going to be much less. Uh, keep in mind that the multipliers, if you multiply the mantissa of a floating point value, the amount of area that is needed for that multiplication is quadratic in the length of the number of bits in the mantissa. So if you're only multiplying four or five bits of mantissa instead of eight or, or, or nine, that gives you a quadratic uh, savings in terms of area and power, or you can get back much more, much more um, arithmetic uh, capabilities on the same piece of silicon. Well, dynamic range and precision, which are pretty much mainstays of um, machine learning and machine learning processing, how do you apply those? How do you build those into the fabric of what your, your processor? Yeah, that, that means that the hardware has to support different data types natively compared to what you had before in FPGAs. In FPGAs, uh, traditionally you had what was called DSP blocks. The data types that were supported by those DSP blocks were driven by the requirements of digital signal processing algorithms, such as FIR filters, FFTs, and so forth. Those are very different from what you need in an AI space. In the AI space, what you really need is a dot product engine building block. That's simply what you see here. Here you see a, a multiplier, 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 and then you add all these products together, just as specified by this formula here. And then in the end, you have to do an accumulation to calculate every element of the output vector B. So what you need to be able to support in the AI ML space is a whole bunch of different data types varying from 4-bit data types, 6-bit, 8-bit, 16-bit uh, integer data types, as well as floating point uh, arithmetic, where you do uh, pure floating point arithmetic in order to support all the different variants of algorithms that people want to be able to map to FPGAs to exploit the flexibility of FPGAs. So how many are there of those in a chip? What you see here is a conceptual diagram of what we call the MLP, the Machine Learning Processor. In, you can draw a box around the MLP, and it could look like this. This would be one MLP, and the multipliers and the adders can be fractured to support narrower data types. So you can have up to 32 multipliers that do each do a 4x4 four four bit multiplication and you can uh, configure the MLP differently, and then you can do four 16 by 16 bit multiplications and a lot of different modes in between to give that flexibility. Do you get more performance and lower power by adding more of those and doing processing that way, or do you get more from, say, adjusting your precision and your dynamic range? That's ultimately all flexible. That's really up to the, to the user. This is one MLP. You have, like I said, you, uh, anywhere between 4 and 32 multipliers in this MLP, and you can stack them together. Uh, there are, in our first tape out, there will be 2,560 of these MLPs that can then be joined together to do many multiplications in one step, or just break down the matrix vector multiplication into a lot of different chunks, as is allowed by the algorithm, which is parallelizable. If you're a hardware engineer working in one of these systems, what do you have to know that you didn't know before? You would probably have to look at the uh, basics of the algorithm again. The MLP is configurable in very many different ways. What is very important is that you can take advantage of the memories that are very closely associated with the MLP. That kind of reuse that is inherent to matrix vector multiplication is very important to really get a lot of performance out of the architecture. And really what you're doing is thinking about this from a data-centric point of view as opposed to the hardware itself, right? It's how does the data move? That's very important. In our jargon, it's actually, we always say, 
it's very easy to cram more multipliers into an MLP. It's very hard to keep them busy. So what you see here, all these memories uh, here that can be configured in a whole bunch of different ways, really supports the um, exportation of data we use that is inherent to the algorithm. And it can be done in a number of different ways. Where would you see chips like this being used? Would they be in a data center? Would they be at the edge, in an edge device? We expect that you will find these devices in data centers where there's a lot of need for new algorithms that are still evolving that uh, cannot be predicted. There's going to be a new algorithm every few months that people want to use, that people want to optimize. Maybe not so much in a doorbell uh, on, on your front door, but there's a wide spectrum of applications where you will find a need for this level of flexibility. So what are some of the trade-offs here? You can take advantage of the inherent characteristics of the application domain here. One of them is that I haven't mentioned yet is what we call locality. It so happens that within a matrix A, you, you have a lot of locality. Locality means that the values in the matrix that are adjacent are correlated in terms of their magnitude. So if you draw a little box in the matrix around a number of values, then you will kind of find that the magnitude of these values it will be closely correlated. They will be in a similar range. This actually allows you to do something much, much more powerful, which again, the MLP supports natively in hardware. It is the only FPJ that supports this type of arithmetic in hardware. What I'm going toward is called block floating point. A block is a number of numbers that have a magnitude that is in a similar range. Simply what you do is you take these values, you extract a common exponent. What's, uh, what's left is just the uh, mantissas that have to be adjusted to the common exponent. You then treat them as narrow integer values that are very cheap to multiply and add. And then you combine those values back to their common, common exponents that are then coming in like so. So we have an additional unit in the MLP that converts the values that were calculated cheaply into floating point values that are then accumulated as floating point entities so as to not lose your um, the precision ac across the range. And so what you've done is really accelerate pattern recognition here, right? Absolutely. You use the all the properties that are unique and uh, inherent to this uh, application domain to take advantage of those in the MLP, just like what we did with the DSP. Now in the MLP, we use similar philosophies to really accelerate the machine learning algorithms. Raymond Nyssen, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.